Okay, well, good afternoon. And uh, what is today? Friday, February 3rd. Um, I'm Connie Davis. I'm so excited, you guys, to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, dedicating the birthday week of Keros. We are two years old. I didn't, uh, didn't expect to have such amazing people around me um, this week um, as we stepped into the second year. Carrie has joined me um, as a trusted colleague and um, str strategic consultant as well. Um, super excited to have him on the journey with me and each of you that I call our Project Triton ambassadors. Just thank you for being here. Um, I would say that uh, this year has been a proof that, well, it's last several months actually, we have not had roads where we're going and we are figuring this out as we go, but the spirit of teamwork is super high and um, I am so uh, just happy and grateful for the energy, the passion um, for this particular topic to kind of serve the world. And um, we are actually really in a place of heart-centered technology. I think we're embracing that term. Um, I love Ruby uh, and Boomer who talk about empowerment through technology. So you're, those are terms you're gonna be hearing, but I love this phrase where it's, you know, that, that old uh, uh, doc from back to the future where we are going, there are no roads. And that is literally where we are headed. So with that, I'm gonna um, kick us off. We're gonna talk about um, a couple of things this year. Just um, in the uh, hindsight, 2022 was a year of clarity. So where Caro started out to be kind of a consultant for uh, data and technology for social good, we started out with cryptocurrency and blockchain. That uh, kind of took us into a project where we helped to build a crypto platform that is now getting ready to go to market. Um, they uh, have a, uh, over a 15 million valuation before they've even gone to market. And that is just a testament of kind of product strategy and design. That's my uh, background, fractional product management and design. But what I'm most excited about is the folks that are on the phone today is we've really figured out a dream and a blueprint towards making a difference and an impact in the world. And we started in Giving Tuesday. So our Giving Tuesday event, if you missed it, it's on our YouTube channel. You can um, pick up on many of the individuals on this phone that talked about what keeps them up at night, what some of the challenges are in the uh, trauma impacted population. And um, I've also, we've also established solid partnerships with the folks on the phone that are representing organizations like NPEIV, uh, USF and uh, the Herald Center, uh, Humanistic Technologies. And then I'm really happy and proud to be um, part of the Paytech Women uh, Organization, which is a volunteer group of women in payments and banking services, 5,000 women across the country and heading up the innovation lab there. So super excited about some of the opportunities this year. Um, also, we have on the phone, um, Aldo is with us from Utternick. So Utternick has sponsored uh, the financial relationship with money survey. So if you could all just take your phones out, if you haven't heard of this survey, this is for financial empowerment. Uh, we have created with the help of Ruby and her team at Humanistic Technologies and Utternick, um, a survey that's probably the first of its kind to uh, survey the general public with their relationship with money. And so we've been socializing this. We're going to get this information out after the session, but go ahead and scan that QR code. And if you take a few minutes to take the survey yourself uh, during or after the session today, but it's really about cheering on, um, I think, a, a project where we're elevating and amplifying the voices of many, many people in this world that are struggling with economic and financial abuse and adversity. And I think the milestones that we have been kind of marching towards are starting to come into focus. The story is coming to um, real fruition and we have voices and all kinds of material and research that the team on the phone are gonna speak about today. Um, before we get started, I thought I would just share some numbers as we found them when we began, when we began this project. And it, I call it the trajectory of doing nothing because up until now, we have not um, seen an effort like this in our industry. I can speak to that. I've been in the banking and payment space for 25 years. There's never been anything like this done. And I'm probably more um, passionate and uh, you know just driven to do this because of that. But some numbers that I pulled, so we have access to a national data graph uh, courtesy of our partners at Audience Acuity. 
Um, the national consumer data graph shows 230 million adults in the United States. The um, trauma infographic by uh, one of the um, research organizations published uh, talks about 70% of the adults in the US have some type of trauma. So Dr. Shelley Wagers is probably gonna talk a little bit about that. And all of the um, speakers today are coming from that school and uh, expertise of thought. But that means that's 223 million adults in the US out of that 223. Then we talk about the rural population, those living in bank and food deserts, um, those that are survivors in those much of those same geographic areas, 30 million individuals have confirmed based on the report from free from that they don't have the right financial resources. So we're digging in and getting more specific. And then 22 million of those, according to the graph, um, are living in rural impoverished areas making less than 50,000 a year in annual income. And we all know what the cost of inflation is costing all of us. Um, so the agenda today is we are gonna talk about 2023 being the year of empowered action. So empowered action from a heart center. So I've asked each of our uh, Project Tri uh, Triton ambassadors um, to speak a little bit about how we consult with data, what Keros is up to. So Carrie will kick us off. And then Dr. Shelley Wagers is gonna talk about the research that she's been doing so graciously for us. Um, Susan and I have been co-chairing and chairing together Action Team 3. She's gonna talk about ways that we suggest practicing this in the community. And then Ruby and Boomer will, um, from Humanistic Technologies Inc. Are, is gonna talk about a prototype project that we're really excited about where we empower humans through technology. So I think with that, Carrie, um, before I turn it over to you, I wanna just share, I had this really funny idea last night. We've talked about human-centered technology. I went and I asked that question of ChatGPT um, and even ChatGPT calls out key terms. I didn't expect this kind of res uh, response, but to hear that it has potential to have significant impact the way that it's designed, using human values and well-being, um, technology with ethical and social implications. So the computer definitely understands. But what I found super interesting was that when we sit and try to have these conversations with banks and credit unions and fintech providers, I hear um, silence. I feel um, pause. I feel challenging, uncomfort conversations coming, right? That it's difficult to have a conversation when we talk about trauma, but it's easier when we start talking about heart-centered and healing-centered mm -hmm. communities that support each other. So I really thought that this was a very good explanation of from a computer, what is possible that humans can deliver in this world. So Carrie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank um, you. Let me talk a little bit more. Thanks very much. I appreciate being here and being in the presence of all of our partners and the other folks in the audience that we're working with. Uh, interesting bit about myself because Connie is usually the mouthpiece of everything and I kind of work in the background with her, uh, which this is my anniversary too. Um, a year ago, almost to the day, I met Connie and I started to work with her. Um, gosh, my background, even uh, let's say the past seven years, is uh, I was working with machines, Internet of Things. I was working with machines that would tell you when they're sick, when they needed to be fixed or maintained. And you could say it's kind of boring, but it's kind of interesting because it kept the supply chain going, uh, you know, even after COVID, right? But really where the epiphany came for me is that I did consulting with a French company. Uh, it was an artificial labs uh, firm where they had an algorithm to be able, we called it unbiased, uh, unbiased uh, viewing of somebody, where we brought that to the financial marketplace, specifically mortgages, where we helped a couple of mortgage companies extend mortgages out to people they would have never thought of extending a mortgage out to before. I got done with my gig and that's where I met Connie and it was just such a perfect segue into what I'm doing now. Uh, it, was, it was coined heart, heart, uh, heartfelt technologies or heart-centered technologies. We are planning to advance the slide, please. Um, it, it could mean, especially technologists, it could mean a lot of different things, but really where 
I think that it, it best focuses is that you have, you're looking at technology through a lens of diversity, equality, and inclusion. And it's really the ethical interpretation of data. It's free, as best as we can say, free of bias, to help make sound business practices and to enhance a community, to solve problems, to ensure growth, both economically and socially. Advance it again, please. When people ask me who are, who, who's, 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 who's Keros, what do we do? Well, you know, you guys can read it there, but I really say that, and they get it, they get it right away, no matter really who I'm talking to, that we're bringing technology to organizations that are helping uh, abused women, young adults aging out of foster care, veterans, and the incarcerated enter back into society one step at a time. And they said, well, you know, how, how do you go about doing this? It's really that we're working with partners, trusted partners that, you know, we have a business relationship, but it's kind of cool that some of them have also become our personal friends as well. You don't really get that in business many times. But the point, point of it is that these are professionals that look at the craft that they do, that they want to help people that they have, um, it, it's either non-predatory loans or just a way to be able to use technology, as I described before, to be able to look at the whole person and figure out how can we help them advance the economy. And, you know, as far as what we do, well, again, everybody on, on this call kind of knows that we are a consulting company. We don't prescribe first, we listen before any prescription is done or anything like that. But the nice thing is that then we can offer financial services, financial technology, ethical data science, and then our, our partners from academia, that it gives us really the, the gravitas to be able to say, here's what we know, here are the populations, here are the people that are suffering, and that we combined can help these these people. So it's really a cool thing in terms of what we're doing. And uh, I just feel blessed to be able to be in the presence of you all. And uh, I'll turn it over to you right now, Shelly, for your 10 minutes of fame. Thank you, Carrie. So I'll do a, a quick introduction. I actually first met Connie through my work at the University of South Florida in our human trafficking lab. And I met her as part of her consulting with Keros to potentially help us raise funds. I quickly looked at, because I'm also the president of the National Partnership to End Interpersonal Violence, her skills and talents could be useful for MPIV. So MPIV has also been consulting and working with Connie. And from that, we grew to, I brought in Susan, you'll hear from her in a little bit. Uh, a relationship of what I call shared information, uh, working together to bridge the gap from our area of expertise, which is in uh, understanding trauma, social services. I'm a criminologist, so I work with various victims of violence. And um, Susan will share a bit of her background in MPIV as a practitioners and academics with all these varied backgrounds in social work, psychology, and trying to better understand the interconnected nature between violence and abuse to a multitude of things. And one of the gaps we've always had has been addressing financial abuse, better understanding the role financial abuse plays. And a typical approach in our field has been to always go to the victim with a hundred things they should, could, and need to be doing and providing services to get out of the violence. And one of those relates to banks and finances. And one of the last areas we've studied has actually been a better understanding of that financial abuse, but also what happens and occurs and the blockades for victims being able to get back on their feet that are structurally embedded within um, the systems, the financial systems that kind of keep this circular going and cause them to go back to the offenders. And 
um, continue in the violence. And that affects different groups differently, but there's not a lot of research in this area. This is new. And of course, we don't have a lot of banking and fintech knowledge. So through the relationship with Connie, that's where we all started learning and coming together to see what we could share. Next slide, Connie. So I wanted to start with this group today to give you a little idea of if when you talk about diversity and equity inclusion, to better understand what that really means or should mean to really impact these communities. Connie gave you some statistics. And um, although those are hard statistics we have from science, I can tell you personally, because of the work I do, I have never met at least a woman that didn't share with me a history of some form of violence that has occurred to them and some form of financial blockage that they've had. Whether it's making less money than their male counterparts in a job, they can't get a bank account in different ways. Um, and so when you do this work, you get those types of disclosures on a regular basis. So I think about today how we're approaching, high, in higher ed, we're doing it too, and in industries, diversity, equity, inclusion. It reminds me of how we approached uh, disability about three decades ago, which was a good buzzword. And we had this buzzword where we all said, oh, if I just put this program in place or if I put a ramp up to my bathroom, you know, I have ADA compliance now. And what we didn't fully understand is kind of what's represented on the social ecological models, which really a theoretical model we use and Dr. Salinas uses a lot in public health that I, I want to put out there for you all to think about what it means for diversity, equity, inclusion. And this is how we approach the research to better understand how to truly raise up communities from that perspective in a heart-centered place. So you see the individuals, the smallest, then we see relationship, community, and societal. So think about this model representing a complex interplay between all those levels to have a better understanding of the range of different risk factors that can either put a person at risk or provide protective factors. What that can mean in this type of project though, is these are the risk factors that create structural barriers to financial services and access that we have created over the decades within uh, banking and FinTech and just how we've structured. I think one of the best examples of that is that women in general couldn't even get a bank account until the seventies on their own. This still plays out today. And in the research I've already started doing, I saw this from a member from the banking community that I interviewed herself that was retired and telling me in her retirement, her husband passed away and she can't access certain joint bank accounts because she's the woman and it's their money and she's going through numerous hoops, but none of her male widower friends have the same hoops. So think of this ecological model from an intersectionality standpoint and a diversity, equity, inclusion is we have at a societal level, a certain history that impacts different group members differently. I'll use myself as an example. I'm a female and I'm white and I'm middle class. Therefore, and I'm gonna pick on Ruby, my experience is still fundamentally different than Ruby's, although she's a female, I know from her history, she's not necessarily from the same middle class and definitely wouldn't be what we categorize as white when we're checking a box in her ethnicity or nationality. Therefore, it socially locates her differently to have different experiences and different barriers. It might place her in a different community. The community is where schools, workplaces, neighborhoods, the amount of money I have, my access to money is going to put me in communities or different communities that could have different levels or crime that might occur, different risks, different traumas. And then relationship is our family and our close relationships. And then, of course, our individual level. Next slide, Connie. So when we think about research and what we're trying to do in research, if you truly want to create diversity, equity, inclusion, you have to first admitting the unconscious biases that are embedded within all of our traditional practices, whether we're talking the banking industry or higher ed or any industry, but they're certainly in the banking industry. 
those practices privilege certain groups to have easier access and naturally hinder other groups to have a more difficult access. And we're actually seeing that in the preliminary research we're doing. So when we start to think about what, why, or how, when we're looking at findings when we do the research, we're looking at right now, what is it that's needed? What do these different groups need? And where's their crossover across those groups? Why do they need it? What has been in the way? And based on that, what are we gonna recommend how to address that need? So we've been talking about this traumatized group or victims of violence initially, but I've started to expand that view and what we're looking at now is when they belong to different groups, how have they had different access or um, less access? And based on that, what would we recommend would be the types of products? On the other side, we have the banking and fintech industry. And the banking and fintech industry is a business, a business model, and they're heavily regulated. So within those regulations, why are they regulated? Why have we develop the structures that we do, what was the purpose to them? And based on that, how are we going to shift them in a way that they could have more business, better business while helping these groups? This is how we've been coming out with these preliminary research. So what we started to find, when you do the research from a standpoint of a scientific structure, now what you have is something that's objective, it's verifiable. Um, we from that can draw subjective interpretive insights and then we can prescribe or give a recommendation or a direction of a prototype that can meet different groups. And within that, we're working to develop what would be the cost benefit analysis for the bank side to create certain products that then can meet the needs of the other side in a way that's non-predatory and works where they're at to build equity over time. So then we have our data, we learn to understand the data and we develop the action plan. So some preliminary findings that are of interest because we've talked to both sides, bank, FinTech and um, victim survivors of violence and some key overlaps are happening that I think start to lay out where we move. One is loyalty. Very important to the banks and banking industry to have loyal customers. If I open a checking account now, I want to do, I want them to have multiple products. I want them to stay. I want them to tell everybody about me. And if they end up having a business someday, take business loans. That's important. Well, if we go to the survivor side, the bank or the group or the org that gave them that first shot and really listened to them they stay loyal to them. And Susan's going to talk about that. So by being able to offer them and as they grow over time, as they come out of the situation and develop income and money, they have more products and they stay with that institution throughout the rest. I mean, they're very loyal. So we see an overlap there. The other is relationships. Banks are more, um, this difficulty of moving away from that one-on-one, -on -one, that bank in the community and going to tech excludes many of these groups. It's really hard to make a move in that direction and have actual diversity, equity, inclusion. Many of the groups and uh, communities, if you look at that model, they are not gonna have the same tools to access online and they wanna need relationships. But what's interesting is for banks to have loyal customers, they have to have relationships too. So it's this, how do we work within the current structures today to figure out a cost, a cost effective way for banks to bring that relationship aspect back as being important and we can reach this group. And the third key thing I saw was this, the numbers Connie gave you, I'm gonna say are probably wrong. And it's because there's more people. It's even more than she's saying, because in all of the FinTech and banking interviews I've done, although none of them would share with you their community, their backgrounds, every single one male and female shared a trauma background with me. So what that tells us is they might have had other protective factors that helped them reach financial security, but they all had some were from foster care. Some had mothers who were homeless at different times because of fleeing violence. And within their own industry, because it's a different culture, there isn't a sense of safety to discuss these things. So I go back to the ADA real quick before I wrap up Connie and the decades ago, because now we have research that shows us everything that gets put into place to make something accessible when we think of someone who's a 
blind or um, uh, hearing impaired or have a physical mobility. Those of us who don't have those still utilize those tools and it enhances and increases customers for those groups. So from our perspective and what we're seeing so far, I'm going to say for an action plan is if you start to put things in place that can meet these groups, what you're going to do is create a more user-friendly, relationship-style built system that people who aren't what we call the clinical victims of violence, but the rest of us who walk around that maybe aren't seeking those services, but have these types of backgrounds, which is almost everybody, they're going to be drawn to those services and companies as well, too. So it's going to reach them similar to we see what we uh, with ADA over time. So this is the research we're seeing so far in that there will be a way to work within the heavy regulations of the banking community to meet certain needs that could expand uh, the business in a way that is cost uh, effective uh, for banking and fintech, but we have a ways to go to figure out what those are, uh, working across those groups and then testing them. I'm sorry, and Susan, now to Thank you. <laughs> Thank Susan. you, I'm going to unmute here. Um, so um, it's great to be here. It's great to talk all these different things I don't know much about. So this is exciting. Um, and the, the cross-pollination has been very, very amazing. So I'm Susan O'Million. I'm an attorney. I have worked with um, domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse um, survivors for about 40 years. Um, I have um, worked as an attorney representing them in court, um, going through divorce. I have um, worked with sexual assault uh, victim advocate as a victim advocate with women going through the criminal justice system. And I've also worked with sexual on sexual harassment over a number of years. I'm also a survivor of homicide. Uh, my niece Maggie was killed by her ex-boyfriend when she was 19. Uh, that was about 20 years ago. So um, I have uh, I am a survivor who has understood um, and experience at a very emotional level what it means for women not to get out um, and not to get out safely. So I bring all of that with me. Um, I'm also part of the National Partnership to End Interpersonal Violence, which we call NPIV, because it's quicker to say. Um, and um, I've been a member of the Action Team 3, which is um, a team that has worked um, with a group of people who are in practice uh, in general. So I, my attorney practice, a number of the people on the uh, on the team are also um, therapists, trauma specialists, therapists. Uh, a number of people are survivors on our on our team uh, of domestic violence, sexual assault, and also um, people who work in domestic violence or sexual assault crisis intervention programs, which are the programs that are free. Um, some provide shelter, but many provide advocacy on a number of levels. One of the things I want to say about um, the empowering practice here is that we are actually, as an as an as a group of people who have been working as advocates for many years on domestic violence and sexual assault, I think we're just coming into understanding a lot more the impact of fi of financial abuse. For many years, domestic violence was sort of framed a little bit more narrowly, usually about physical violence and emotional violence, but um, or verbal abuse, um, you know, insults. And um, but not going to physical um, to physical abuse uh, in 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 the course of the relationship it might happen but but starting out perhaps with just emotional abuse and I don't want to say the word just because it's not just but but it's a it's a stage that many um, offenders go through I've also done about 15 years of working with male domestic violence offenders I've also seen it sort of seen it from their point of view financial abuse is a way to keep the manipulation going to keep women in relationships and, and be intimidated. And also it's a way to not allow them to get out. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. So I'm gonna talk first about what our team has been doing. So Connie, if you can change the slide there for me. So what we've been gathering together, not that we don't know this, but we have never sort of written them down ourselves. Sort of what we, what Connie calls real life stories, what we call personas or scenarios um, that sort of represent 
in many ways what people somewhat know about domestic violence, but in the sense of, in many cases, the stories are presented in kind of a victim blaming way, like in these three scenarios, you know, why didn't you leave sooner? Um, you know, you know, you, you stayed in a long term relationship. And what do you mean you're disadvantaged? What how could you be disadvantaged? And then finally, you know, what's intolerable about this marriage and the real issue about children and how children complicate the in the ability for people to get out, for women to get out with their kids. So what we started to do is pull together these scenarios and what we're trying to show, and I, as I said before, we haven't really documented in this movement where financial abuse really shows up and how, how uh, potent it is, not only in the relationship to make it more and more difficult to leave, but to actually get out. So there's some research that kind of stunned me actually. And the research says that um, uh, 70, well, first of all, that 94 to 99% of domestic violence survivors describe that they had financial abuse also in their relationship. So also meaning there was verbal abuse, intimidation, manipulation. Today, we use a word in the domestic violence movement called coercive control, which sort of begins to wrap together and give women more, more, um, what would be the word, more um, uh, language to describe it. So uh, 94 to 99% of women re who are survivors re report that they had some kind of financial abuse. And secondly, that 73% of survivors stayed longer than they wanted to in a relationship because they couldn't afford to leave. And 50% of them stayed two years or longer. Now, my work with women, particularly even women who, who may not have let, uh, brought the situation to a level of physical abuse, 10 minutes can be a life sentence. Two years is just really hard to imagine. So this has become really, really important for us to do it. And the other thing I want to say before I toss it over to Connie is that Connie said in the very beginning that this is a never been done before scenario uh, in the uh, banking industry. Well, it's a never been done before scenario in the domestic violence movement. In my experience that for many years, and it's been a really admirable um, effort, is to the solution to this financial abuse, not just getting out, but the long term impact of it, which is going to be lifelong for women, um, is that we were doing wonderful. <laughs> but just sort of short-term financial literacy with these women. And uh, a number of large organizations like the Allstate Foundations put many, many, many dollars in many, um, uh, many ways to get this information out there. But until I met Connie, I never thought about, well, how about going to the source of some of this or the place where, and it, as she described, there's a win-win situation. You know, if customers need to come to banks more and be more, more involved with banks, then we have customers for you. And they are very loyal. Um, I know many women who find anybody out there in the community that can help them. And the minute they know that person and it's a, it's a reliable source, they will tell everybody in their support group to come and support them. That kind of loyalty because the women know how desperately they need someone to understand, not just blame them for why didn't you leave, but to understand there's a reason why you can't leave and there's a danger that we can certainly uh, foreclose. So that's the kind of work that I think we've been able to add to this um, this process and also to help people understand that it's not just a one-time thing. It is very difficult to get out without money, that's for sure. And But secondly, the long-term impact of this, which ties into other long-term issues for women and how we see ourselves coming into the world and not just for the women, but their children also. Okay, I think I've got it, Connie. Thank you, Susan. And we're not gonna spend a lot of time on these particular slides because I wanna get to Ruby and Boomer's update. Um, it's really exciting and why we're here to really celebrate today. Um, but this is just an example of some of the work that's gonna be coming. Um, some of the educational materials, workshops, eBooks, things like that, that we're gonna be bringing soon to this community um, to drive more discussion, get more people to the table, because it is going to take a village to solve for this. But I wanted you to see the breadth of the um, expertise and the knowledge and the commitment from this group of uh, very trauma-informed individuals. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on to the next section. Um, uh, and Ruby and Boomer, I'll turn it over to you. 
Sorry, I had a, I was trying to figure out the mute button. I apologize. My name's Drew Guillen. I'm from California. I work with a team from, from uh, University of South Florida, and we have a tech company, Empower Technologies. Basically, what we do, we, we focus on how do we empower the most vulnerable populations using technology. And uh, we met Connie through Shelly, through the network of, of helping profession. And it's really so the helping profession. I know you heard about domestic violence, but I'm a child abuse investigator focusing on infant homicides. Uh, and so I look at the trauma piece when someone dies. And so I'm also part of the research group for the state of California. Um, so I've been doing massive research for all 58 counties. And so we're looking at trauma, the trauma process. And so, yes, there is domestic violence, but it's not just domestic violence because you have a plethora of victims. You have their children, you have communities, you have all these folks that are suffering you know, trauma and how do you negotiate trauma from a financial lens? So, you know, I've been approached by other tech companies and um, FinTech relating to trauma. And so the thing about those companies and versus Connie's work is a lot of these fintech companies approached me and they wanted to make a buck. There was a main drive was making money. And so I wasn't comfortable where you wanna make money off the back of an abused child. It didn't fit right with me. And so when uh, Connie approached me, she was empathic. She was um, caring and, that, and how she approached FinTech, um, it resonated with me and I was willing to help. And so I have a team of technologists that have the same beliefs of the empowerment process in technology. So from a perspective of technologies, it's not just California, New York, Texas, not the United States. I'm also involved with the United Nations. And in the United Nations, I just came back last week where we're looking at how do we empower vulnerable communities across the waters. So my goal is if we can solve this at the local level, local meaning the United States, does it have global implications? And the answer is yes, because violence is a global entity. Violence is, is something that will never go away. So how do we empower women and children? And we empower them financially. And how do we do that? Connie is my key. Connie's going to show us how to create those avenues where we can empower children, empower their mothers, and empower these families out of destitute. And that's how we make change. We make change what? One person at a time. We make change by bringing people together that have the same philosophies. And I'm very, very, I'm very fortunate to meet Connie and her team. I am over the moon to be working with her. So I'm going to introduce Boomer. Boomer is my tech, and he's going to talk more about tech and his experience, his lived experience. And what does it mean from a technological perspective? Boomer, take it away. Well, thank you, Ruby. It's, I'm grateful, humbled, and blessed to be here uh, at this event for Kairos. Um, my name is Boomer Rose. I'm our UX UI expert at Humanistic Technologies Incorporated. And I think uh, now we're going to kind of bring it full circle. We've heard from a criminologist. Well, my area of expertise and subject matter expertise is um, I'm a grateful recovering addict, formerly incarcerated, formerly homeless, a survivor of child abuse, and a survivor of domestic violence. So what makes the technology that we develop here at Humanistic Technologies different than other companies and other tech companies is that being that we are a team of social workers, right? A team of individuals with lived experience. We are able to utilize that lived experience to understand uh, the services that individuals and our consumers and our participants need at a deeper level. Um, and before we move on to the next slide, uh, Shelly was talking about that research process as well. And what makes the technology that we build also very interesting is that we really align what we do with the academic research process. So Shelley talked about the uh, social ec ecological model. And if you place the technology that is developed with the individual in mind and you focus on DEI, you focus on their relationship with the technology, you focus on their relationship with the community, then we can create societal, societal change. It can also create data that we actually need 
not the data that corporations and governments think that we need. And this data and technology is then able to be validated as it follows that academic research model that Shelly mentioned, and it's trauma-informed. It helps reduce barriers, and it creates data that we can understand, create change, and improve the standards of care, and eventually policy and legislature. So that's gonna take me to that next slide. There we go. So about a year ago, uh, Humanistic Technologies, uh, Ruby, Joseph, our other partner who's not here today and I, um, we were grateful to meet an amazing nonprofit here in uh, Pinellas County, Florida called Empower to Change. Empower to Change focuses on individuals that are survivors of human trafficking and individuals that are re-entering society from both prison and local municipality jails. These individuals face extreme barriers when they're re-entering society. ETC is an organization that formerly was ran on paper-based procedures and protocols. Humanistic Technologies, we took the, their protocols and we, de we developed it into a mobile application that allows their case managers and their participants to adhere to all the protocols and procedures that they have to do for uh, courts, for probation, and just for the basic protocols of that program through a mobile technology and a desktop portal for the case mentors. So in this technology, as you see in this process flow, we're tracking meetings, we're doing job search entries, we're approving jobs, we're asking for overnight requests, and eventually this data and information is validated and sent to the courts or the probation officers, right, to help these individuals not uh, go back into jail or prison. And why that's important is while this is just one nonprofit, that in this first year with 160 participants, 60 at any given time, we've tracked over 8,000 meetings. We've had over 700,000 user engagements, and we are creating monumental change with this one nonprofit. On a national level, over 600,000 individuals are released from prison or uh, jail every year. And between 41 and 85% of these individuals will reoffend within two years, depending on the area, right? I know Florida is a little lower than some of the other states. So after this first year in this pilot program, we now have some really exciting processes that are getting ready to come to fruition. Um, we are going to keep the current procedures that we have, and we are going to add in new levels of authentication and validation through um, partnering with uh, Anonibit for facial biometric recognition that is decentralized and really kept in a safe place and a key for those individuals to protect their identity. And also uh, biometric signature ID for their um, signature aspect as well. And where this comes into play is now it's gonna create a workload in, uh, reduction for the case mentors because instead of having to validate these signatures and identities by hand, right? And by, by visual, It'll now be done through the applications um, of BioSig ID and Anonibit, which then, because it's authenticated through their process, which is almost impossible to hack, right, uh, or to, to get through, um, that creates a new standard of care and quality for the courts, right? And they can almost guarantee that these individuals are the ones adhering to these uh, stipulations. Um, alongside that, uh, kind of reverting back to the financial aspect as well, these individuals face immense barriers as myself, I remember when I tried to get a bank account after getting out of jail, I was told no. And then when I finally got one, I went and I said, will you please run my identification? I don't know if you're going to be able to give me a bank account, but I really need one. And I got it. And I was lucky and I was grateful, right? And I've kept that bank account ever since. But I didn't understand finances and the trauma that I had gone through caused me to spend money in ways that I didn't understand why I was spending it. So on top of this, we're also partnering, uh, which you'll hear about, I think from Carrie and a few, um, with some other organizations to, hope, to help uh, these individuals get bank accounts, right? To have access to financial literacy courses, to have trauma-informed training so that they can understand their actions and how to have healthy coping skills to help improve their post-traumatic growth. Um, we're very excited about this project. We're very excited about the partnerships um, that are coming into play here in this first quarter of 2023. And uh, we are extremely grateful to be working with Keros and all of these partners to really create monumental change. 
because similar to what we used to hear about with like that trickle down economy that I always heard in political <laughs> debates growing up, right? We're flipping that script and we are going to trickle up, right? We can grow from the grassroots and the individuals that are most vulnerable and understand their needs and create technology that will create the change to help these individuals thrive in this world, no matter what they have been through. Thank you. Well, Connie, I guess now you 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 flipped that to me being a bad drill sergeant that <laughs> I have to show a Gantt chart. But uh, Boomer, <laughs> I thought you were going to do that. But you're you're the nice guy, and I sincerely mean it. You're a heck of a nice guy. Bottom line to it, folks, and that there's 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 several of you that are out there uh, that will be participating in this. I'll call it a pilot, but it's a great start. It's a great start to everything that. Uh, Ruby and Con and uh, uh, Boomer have mentioned, and essentially it's real. If you look from January up to uh, the end of May, and then going on to April and May, it's it, it, it's real. Uh, we're having Monday, I call them Monday morning meetings, but the reason I'm saying that is that we can just identify any problems, anything that are, could be a holdup with the project. And then from that, I can ju just run uh, really quick uh, scrums with folks ju just to iron things out. But as you see from the diagram that Boomer mentioned, our partners are there. And if you're a partner and you don't see your, your name there, it doesn't mean that, that, that we're not going, it's not going to be included down the road. But point of it, and especially I want to call out the last three elements where you're looking at user engagement, uh, for for uh, meeting and traffic and, and uh, tracking, you can see that it's going to be starting in March. It really is, has begun in January, but where our technology is coming into, or at least I think the first wave, which would be the security aspect of it, um, you can see those numbers trending. Where what we did in January, now it's going to increase two times, and then in in May three times. This is real. This is an awesome project, and I'm just blessed that we put together some uh, really good partners to make this thing happen. And that's all I have to say about that. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, so as we kind of get ready to wrap up, um, one of the things, and I don't know why we have a yellow doodle on the screen. Do you guys see that, where that came from? Somebody doodled. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so the, the the focus and thank you all for the updates. I hope you all hear the amazing things that are happening um, between this collaborative group and the, um, somebody's doodling. I think that's my granddaughter actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, so. Um, and that's probably her doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love it. Gifts from the future. Sorry, it was not well. I couldn't figure out how to get it off the pen. Sorry about that. <laughs> Well done, Jess. <laughs> uh, all right, so we are we're doing the scoping. We are um, well underway with that. So uh, Boomer and I are headed to the ETC group to meet with them on Monday to sit down and have some lunch, build up some um, relationship with them. And we are working on letters of intention so that we can really set the stage for you all that are, you know, dependent on moving capital dollars around or prioritizing resources and uh, teams to meet us um, in the timeline here that Carrie laid out, so important. Um, the fundraising and the research is so important because as you saw that tracking, that's really important so that we can measure the impact the um, individuals that these services will be touching. Um, Shelly and Dr. Abraham over at USF will be um, continuing that work with us and then Ruby, Carrie, Boomer and I and her and then team will be starting to do some grant proposals. There's a number of different grants out there that um, are um, uh, uh, really promoting the work that we all are doing for social good and social justice. So um, we're just really, really excited about the months ahead and, and the weeks ahead. So um, just wanted to provide an update to you all about where we are. And as we head into um, um, a transformational year, which I really believe that we are going to be transforming lives for people by giving them empowerment, uh, you know, and um, access to resources that they so desperately need to turn their their lives around. But it's also going to be creating a 
And I think it's going to be building educational materials and it's going to be helping people understand not just to shrink back from trauma, but to become informed and to understand mm -hmm. what your neighbors and your community residents are going through so that we can elevate and amplify our brands. Um, this is a, uh, an icon that we, um, Boomer and I and uh, Ruby came, to, came up with that's going to help represent the products that come out of this um, collaborative foundry of organizations. And just I just wanted to say thank you all for joining us, um, for spending some time. And then it looks like we have about six minutes left over. Um, hey, Connie, I want you to notice something. Your second generation, what did she draw? She drew a heart, although it's scanted vertically <laughs> or horizontally rather see that so it is heartfelt yep good job nala <laughs> that's right well good on you so do we have any other questions or is there anything percolating out there in the audience um thank you so much for spending some time with us um but yes we look forward to having more conversations with everyone uh about the work that's ahead yes so if there's any questions for the group, feel free to, we can use the next five minutes. Otherwise we can uh, release you to the rest of your day. And thanks for um, spending some time with us. Yes, thank you. Cheers here to a joint success with everybody. Super excited to be part of the team here, uh, Connie and team. And so uh, looking forward to working with you shortly to show it to make this a reality. Thank okay. you. Me. Yep. Thank you guys for a great update. This was phenomenal. Awesome. Thanks, Janine. Thank you guys so much for spending some time with us. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend. Have a great day. Here's to 2023. Have Cheers. a great day.